Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about Victorian, Edwardian literature and beyond as I finish off my fictional bookshelf tour. And the reason I want to do this now is because I am going to be reorganizing my bookcases in a very dramatic way, which maybe I'll talk about later. And I want to uh, get through this final shelf for you before I do that. So, last time we left off with Jules Verne, so we're picking up again in the late 1800s, uh, starting off with Pinocchio. And let's see, I don't remember exactly what year this is, but this is the original Pinocchio by Carlo Collodi. Um, I thought it was an okay book. I'm not really a big fan of Pinocchio, but it was kind of fun to read the original which is quite different from the Disney version and it has some very very quirky illustrations so yeah check that out if you're interested in Pinocchio um, I, I'm definitely going to keep it because it's kind of a kind of an interesting story um, though not my favorite fairy tale uh, a fairy tale I rather like more is Peter Pan this is the Word Cloud Classics version, and uh, I left a lot of marks in it because I really actually loved Peter Pan. I had never read it before, and it was a very, very beautiful story. I'm more familiar with the musical version, which is probably my favorite, um, but this was really fun to read, and it also includes Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens, which is... A related story. Um, yeah, very interesting story, very touching, lots of great quotes. And I recommend it if you enjoy any of the film adaptations or the musical. All right, so really getting to Victorian literature here, we've got She by Ryder Haggard. And uh, this was a very interesting book. I didn't really like it as far as the story, it was very, very sensational, very, very much of the era. Not necessarily in a good way, uh, but it was interesting. It has inspired The Lord of the Rings and other, other uh, classics, so I would say it's certainly worth reading if you want to kind of get an idea of where C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, those kind of authors got their ideas for their uh, queen characters like uh, Jodis and uh, what was the other one? Uh, Galadriel, sorry. And this whole mythos of the the queen, the warrior queen is kind of uh, kind of it's not new to this book but Haggard really sort of set or brought back this concept in a very dramatic way. And so it's really interesting from a literary analysis perspective. So definitely recommend that for that reason, if for no other. The Time Machine was one of the first classics I really enjoyed. And I have this version here which has kind of a 3D cover going on. I actually didn't like it as much the last time I read it but I'm kind of sentimental about it because, again, it was one of the first classics I really enjoyed. I even wrote some terrible fan fiction about it. Um, by terrible, I just mean cheesy. There was nothing bad in it, but uh, very influential to my reading and kind of a childhood favorite. Okay, next up we've got the two uh, books by Conan Doyle, which are his... Uh, I'm not sure what to call this series. It's really just The White Company and its prequel, Sir Nigel. This is a really great story about this young man who lives in a monastery, and before taking the vows to be a monk, he gets a chance to go out in the world and see what it's like before he makes up his mind. Um, so that's what The White Company is about. It's very dramatic. There's a sea battle. There's, you know, all kinds of excitement. And Sir Nigel, I can't really remember that book, but it's about this young man's mentor, Sir Nigel, in his youth. And if you like medieval stories, I definitely recommend these. They're by Doyle, and he always tells a great story with good characters. So, yeah. Recommend those for sure. They're kind of more obscure, but 
they're I would say those books are just as good as Ivanhoe, maybe even better. Um, continuing with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, we've got the Sherlock Holmes series, of course. These are the Barnes & Noble hardcovers. I would like to get the series in individual books because I feel like these are just way too, way too much of doorstoppers to be readable. But I am also kind of sentimentally attached to them because my grandma gave them to me after I helped her out with some stuff. And uh, I've had them forever. And you know, you can't really go wrong with hardcover. But I would like to get the series in individual individual books at some point. Sherlock Holmes was the first character I really fell in love with. And he's still my favorite fictional character to this day, I think. <laughs> uh, it, I need to go back and reread the series. It's been long since I read all of them. And some of them I barely remember. So one of these days I'm going to go back and read them all. This book is one I found in the thrift store and it's called The Final Adventures of Sherlock Holmes with a wonderful picture of Jeremy Brett on the cover. Jeremy Brett's my favorite screen Holmes. And uh, what's cool about this book is it has a lot of stories in it by Doyle which kind of talk about how the character came to be. For example, the mystery of Uncle Jeremy's household. Um, that story was basically the precursor for Sherlock Holmes and the characters in it are the prototypes for Holmes and Watson. So I really recommend this if you're a Holmes fan. It's got all kinds of interesting little stories and excerpts in it. And it also gives you an idea of how this character came to be, how he evolved. So I highly recommend that. Now, unfortunately, the only Chesterton fiction I have is The Man Who Was Thursday. But fortunately, this is still my favorite fictional book by him that I've read. Um, it's a very strange story. It reads kind of like a thriller. It's got a lot of humor. It's got a very strange ending. I read it two or three times and I don't think I really got the ending till the last time. And I think I need to read it again to sort of solidify it in my mind. Um, I do recommend it. I'm not sure if everyone's going to like it, but it's certainly a page turner and very much quintessence of late Victorian literature. Next few books here I've got are my Conrad collection. We've got Lord Jim. We have Heart of Darkness. Really love Heart of Darkness. Um, although I need to reread it along with some criticism because I think that it would help me get a better understanding of the book to see some opposing viewpoints on it. But when I first read it the first several times, I was really struck by um, the message and ju just the writing style was quite interesting to me. I've got Nostromo, which I finally read. You probably remember this from a previous video. Um, great story, not the best Conrad writing. Finally, we've got Under Western Eyes, which is, I would... I would call it a Russian novel, except Joseph Conrad was Polish, so I guess it's a Polish novel, but it's about Russian characters. A fascinating book. It really left a big impression on me when I first read it about people that are caught between different sides of conflict. And that goes for both political uh, and moral conflict. So I want to read this again now that I know a little bit more about Russian history. Uh, but I do remember that the story and the characters really, really resonated with me at the time. So now we've kind of uh, moved past the 19th century, getting into the 20th century, which I don't have a lot of books, but the ones I do have I'm pretty happy with. I've got some Kafka here. We talked about the Metamorphosis last time. Uh, complete short stories. I like this volume because it has all of his short stories as it claims and I think his shorter stories are actually probably better than his longer ones for the most part. I've got A Room with a View. I didn't really like this book. I wish I had liked it more. It just didn't really... I, I didn't feel like 
the characters were completely uh, given justice, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't even know if I reviewed this book, so maybe I'll have to go back and talk about it sometime, but I just found it to be somewhat disappointing. Just like A Passage to India, which I don't have. I have one book by Agatha Christie, although I've read, I'd say, most of her books. At least two-thirds of her books. This is the Miss Marple short stories, or at least some of them. And, uh, I was into Agatha Christie when I was about 12, year old, 12 years old, and I just read nothing but her books for probably a year. <laughs> so I'm kind of burned out of Agatha Christie now. But I still enjoy her stories, I enjoy the TV shows a lot, and... I do want to read some of her uh, recently released books or stories that have just come out um, posthumously. If you're wondering what this is, this is just a music box um, that plays Clara Loon. Yeah, so, okay, where are we now? We are definitely in the 20s, the 1920s, and we've got good old Fitzgerald here. I have two copies of Gatsby. Didn't completely love this book, but it definitely left an impression on me. Um, this one I found secondhand, and I just really liked the cover art, so I was like, I, I better have that copy too since it wasn't, like, expensive or anything. Um, I would say it's a worthy classic. It's certainly a good portrait of America at that time and place, at least in certain societies. Um, I've got a really obscure book here. Memories of the Future um, by this author whose name I probably don't know how to pronounce, so I'm not going to try it. A lot of short stories. Um, this is a 1920s Soviet author. Very interesting writing style. This is some of the most beautiful writing I have ever read. But I will let you know that I didn't understand a lot of it. However, I will definitely be reading it again in the future, so I have hopes that perhaps I will understand it better then. But for but certainly for writing, you really should try reading that. It'll just it's one of those books that changes your mind about how something could be written. And I love books like that. Okay, next I have one book by Hemingway, The Old Man in the Sea. Uh, grew up on the movie with Spencer Tracy. Love it. It's one of my favorite movies of childhood anyway. I have one Woodhouse. Code of the Worcesters, great series. And now we've got C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, who kind of go hand in hand because they are they were friends. Uh, Till we have faces, really powerful story. This one I really related to in a weird way. Um, I could really understand the heroine's conflict and her love for her sister and just everything that was kind of going on in her mind. It was. Such a great read, such a timely read for me, and I highly recommend it. Not everyone likes it, I will have you know, so be warned that you may not like it, but I think it's worth trying. It's an extraordinary book about uh, female characters, and in a weird way, also about Christianity. Of course, we have the Chronicles of Narnia, which is a bit incomplete. Um, The Children of Hurin by Tolkien. I've got The Hobbit, a very sad, worn-out copy of The Hobbit because it's been well-loved in our family. Uh, the Lord of the Flies, which is one of my favorites. Here at the end we've got some more obscure classics I really want to highlight. Embers by Shandor Mari. This is a really, really great book. I had never heard of it until a couple of years ago, but uh, it's just beautifully written. It's kind of a portrait of an era more than a story. 
great, great book. And I will be reading it again at some point. But I just want everyone to know about it. And then moving into authors with Asian heritage, we've got John Okada's No No Boy, which is kind of personal to me in the sense that it's about um, Japanese Americans in the Seattle area, which is where I live. And in particular, this book is about a young man who refuses to fight for the United States in World War II. He's sent to prison for that and then comes back afterwards. And so this book is about the aftermath of of his decision, of his imprisonment, and how he's trying to get back into society and uh, not finding it very easy to do that. This is a very powerful book, very uh, relevant to today with everything that's going on. And I would just strongly recommend reading it. It's not a great book in and of itself, but because of the topics it covers, it's I think it's worth reading. It is pretty dark though, so keep that in mind. And then two books by Kazuo Ishiguro. Um, Artist of the Floating World and A Pale View of Hills. These were books that really resonated with me even more than The Remains of the Day. A Pale View of Hills is a very chilling ghost story, and An Artist of the Floating World is about a man who's looking back over his life after the after World War II and trying to understand if he made the right decisions in being a propaganda artist for the Japanese government. I really love stories that look at things from these kind of unique angles, and Ishiguro is quite capable of writing very, very stirring stories. In my opinion, modern classics. I don't like all of his books, but, you know, now and then he really writes something that's extraordinary. So, I recommend both of these books. So that pretty much concludes my bookshelf tour. Thank you so much to everybody who has, um, been subscribing and leaving comments and stuff. It is very encouraging to me to know that there's other people who enjoy classics and uh, please let me know if you have any ideas of videos you'd like to see and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching!